And when the whole church came together, the small group style of teaching in the synagogue quickly became impractical. It was necessary to, for some of this free dialogue to be regulated to maintain order. And so that's what Paul's dealing with. And the context is when the whole church comes together, okay? All sorts of things do not work, which do work when you're just a, a small group that can dialogue with each other. And so we need to understand the context of that. And from chapter 3 right through to chapter 14, he's dealing with many things which are out of order and need correction. And in chapter 7, he begins dealing with a series of questions which have been written to him. And as I pointed out to you, because of the oral nature of the Greek language at that time, it's very hard in written form to know where it's a question, where it's a statement. And that's part of the confusion, because you've just got to change the tone of voice with exactly the same words, and it goes from a statement to a question. For example, you could say this in 1 Corinthians 14. Let a woman, a woman keep silent in the church, as also the, the law says. But actually, the law doesn't say that. That's our first problem. There's nothing in the Bible that says such a thing. So, therefore, we can rephrase it. Shouldn't a woman keep silent in the church, just like the law says? And it becomes a question that Paul then begins to answer. So he's dealing with the Jewish traditions and Jewish prejudice, rather than teaching it as a principle for the liberated church. Now, these things are difficult to work out, and I don't suppose this side of glory, we're ever going to get it all sorted out, and I don't suppose anyone's ever going to agree. And I, when I first thing I get to heaven, apart from worshipping Jesus, is to go to Paul and say, Paul, couldn't you have written that a little bit more clearly? But as I will show you, there is a purpose. Whenever God causes ambiguity, he causes it for purpose. This is the inerrant word of God, and the fact that it's a little bit confusing is part of God's deliberate plan. That's what we've got to accept in order to discover certain attitudes in our hearts. And I'll deal with that tomorrow, not today, because I feel the right heart will lead us into all truth. So I'm going to move on now to page 9, and, and I want to come to the bottom of page 9 and begin to deal with some of the difficult passages, the first one being 1 Corinthians 11. Now, I know it's not much of an issue in the United States of America, but believe me, it's an issue in many parts of the world. And that is the, the practical uh, requirement for women to cover their heads in church. But certain parts of America, the Amish community, for example, and other places, it's still very much a required thing that uh, he heads are covered. Now, we came from the kind of brethren background when we'd been converted, where that was also the custom where we were. So Eileen did do it. I never could understand why. She couldn't understand why. But so uh, I thought, well, it's better to be on the safe side. So let's get into it. And I'm just going to, first of all, first of all, point out to you that in, there were three cultures in tension here in Corinth. There was the Greek culture, there was the Roman culture, and there was the Jewish culture inside the church. Now, all these three cultures basically taught the same thing, that a woman had to cover her head in public, because for a woman to walk around with loose hair was a, a promiscuous act. It's like sort of a woman walking around topless. It would, it would be as bad as that. And, and, and if she walked around with loose flowing hair in public, she would, she would be declaring herself to be a prostitute and a woman of loose morals. And of course, that could backfire in a horrible way. And so the Paul puts in certain regulations because of the culture and environment which persisted at that time. Now, this kind of culture still exists today in Hinduism and, of course, in Islam. I remember years and years ago in an Indian village with, I think it was with Mohan, I don't remember, it was with someone anyway, and I, it may have been his father, brother, brother John, we were in this particular village in Andhra Pradesh, and, uh, and I, I was teaching, because you've got to bring the kingdom in in spite of the culture, and then you don't accept the culture. It's got, the kingdom has got to give, has got to take over from the culture. And, and, and so I was teaching many things about marriage and many things about women's role and Mohan's father, John, was a courageous man that was, that was breaking open things which had never seen before in India. Women actually free to worship and praise and all kinds of things we'd never seen before. And in this particular village, as I taught this, and we walked down the street, there was a woman walking down the street with loose flowing hair, which was totally culturally unacceptable because normally they have a... They cover their heads, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and this brother said, look, there's the, there's the village prostitute. And, and so obviously that sort of freedom in that kind of cultural environment would be totally misunderstood, and it would bring dishonor to the Lord and bring dishonor to her husband. Now, that, I believe, is at the background of some of these things. 
So I'm going to spend a little time on it, even though it's not relevant, so we can understand uh, the principles. Because most, I don't see anybody here even feeling embarrassed that they have uncovered hair. Well, I want to tell you that you're in a liberty which many don't enjoy. Now, as we go through this letter, he first of all exhorts them in, to imitate him as he imitates Christ. And he talks to them in verse 2 about the, they keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. And he's bringing into them a whole new set of traditions, which are kingdom traditions. And they're clashing with cultural traditions. And he commends us, commends them for keeping those traditions. And if I had time, it's a good study to go through the scripture. And you cannot say that all traditions are wrong. You've got to learn which traditions are right to keep and which traditions are right to abandon. And it's something we've got to become very sensitive and selective about. Because some things have to go. But you don't abandon everything, you know, and into lawlessness or total... You know, if, if it's new, it's right. And if it's old, it's wrong. That's a, that's a naive way of looking. The wise scribe of the kingdom, he takes things old and things new. He holds on to that which is good in the past, but he embraces the new things which are good that God is now doing possibly for the first time. And what hinders the flow of these new things has got to go out of the way. So we really have to learn from Scripture. It's not my subject. I wouldn't have time to do this. We need to go into the Scriptures and find out where we draw the line on traditions, where we keep them and where we abandon them. And Paul gives some very clear guidance, through, through particularly Paul, through his letters, so we know, and Jesus has quite a lot to say as well. And he's commending them for these traditions which he's given them, which are now to replace some of the traditions which they had. He then goes, it seems like to me, in chapter 4, in, in chapter 5 and 6, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 5 and 6, you get saying at these strong words about a woman and the way that if she uncovers her head, she dishonors her head. But as you go on through this, you find that after saying that a woman must have her head covered or veiled, we're finally told as you come down to verse 15 uh, that a woman, if she has long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her as her veil. So you think, now what on earth does this mean? Well, I've been through pretty well every commentary that's ever been written on this chapter, and most of the experts give up in horror and say, this passage is completely incomprehensible to me. I can't make sense of it. And I mean, I mean some outstanding commentators uh, end up with the conclusion, I can't make any sense of this. And, and I, I want you to understand it's difficult, but things began to happen which were not just biblical, they were spiritual experiences which brought us out into the truth of this matter. Now, in our background, in the churches that we were planting and in the network of churches to which we belonged, there was an absolute ardent, headfast rule that women covered their head, and it was required of everybody. In those, in interestingly, today they've abandoned it, but in those days it was a big, it was a big hot issue. And in the churches that I had planted in our particular area, to me it was all incomprehensible. And I said, look, I, can't, I cannot direct you what to do and I don't understand it myself. But what we found was, as we were reaping quite a harvest of new converts, that as the new converts came into the church, uh, young women particularly I'm thinking of, obviously, um, suddenly after a, a week or two they'd be covering their heads. And I said, what happened to them? And there were two ladies in our church which were ardent, militant head coverers. And, and, they, and they would grab these young women and they would get them to cover their heads because it was, it was legally required of them. And these young new converts were, were bullied into putting this stuff, you know, this covering on their head. And that, that troubled me. It, it more than troubled me. But the trouble was I didn't have an answer. And this began to get more and more of a problem. And then through our network of churches, it began to be a bit of a... And so the, the elders said to me, and they said, you must give a, a directive teaching on this. I said, I don't know what to teach. I said, but you've got to say something, otherwise we're going to be in confusion. At least we ought to say it's a matter of conscience, so don't, don't pester these new converts to cover their head if, if that's the most important thing that they've come. I've come to Christ and now I cover my head. And that was the situation. So I agreed on a Sunday night that I would teach my best understanding of this passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, I teach on it, and every, the word went round everywhere. Alan's going to bring the issue of covering, head covering. He's going to settle the issue Sunday night. Everybody, everybody was waiting, in, and they were all going to come. And I, got, I felt worse and worse as that day approached because <laughs> I still couldn't make any sense out of it. And then on the Thursday, just, and I was going to just preach a nice, safe message, well, look, I can't make any sense out of it. Just do what your conscience 
tells you, and, and I was going to use Romans 14, this is an issue of conscience, so let people do what they think is right in their own mind and stop trying to impose it one upon another, which was the best that I could do. But I would, I would have said, well, but if I was a woman to be on the safe side, I probably would have covered my head because I'd rather be over-obedient to Scripture than disobedient to Scripture. That's where we were. Well, Thursday, I had a mighty visitation from God with revelation that completely changed everything. And, and it, it hinges in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 11. I suddenly saw what God was saying. And so if you'd like to come with me, uh, I'm going to take us through that bit. I, I personally believe that verses 5 and 6, Paul was, was answering some questions and, and probably quoting some harsh things which, which were being said or written to him. And, and, but they don't express his own heart. All the traditions mentioned in verse 2. I'm now on page 10 of your notes. But in verse 4 and 7, Paul then continues by teaching something quite revolutionary. And, and, and I want to see this revolutionary thing concerning men. Because we've just read or heard in the other session what the, Tal what, what the Talmud says about men covering their head. So they are to creep into God's presence with this talith, this, this shawl that they wear, and they were coming with face bowed, and this is what it actually says in the Greek, with their faces lowered and bowed, and they come crawling like a, a, a sin, wor sinful worm that's got no right to be in any way uh, uh, in God's presence, and God just have mercy upon you, Lord, forgive me, for I'm an evil, wicked man, what right have I to come into your presence? If you read some church liturgies, they still say those sort of things today. They do in the Anglican church, for example. Have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me. We're not worthy to come into your presence. What God showed me, first of all, was that that's an offense to God. Because one of the things that God showed me was that, 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 uh, that redeemed man, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about both men and women now. Obviously, when I'm using this word, redeemed mankind is the only created being that has the right to come before God and is required to come before God with an unveiled face, boldly able to have face-to-face -face intimacy with God. Even the angels cover themselves. That's what I saw. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but keep your finger in, in 1 Corinthians 11. And this is what it says. And I, it suddenly hit me like a blinding flash of light. And it's talking about people be, as minds being veiled while Moses is read. But it then says, verse 15, but even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Verse 16, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. For we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being changed into, are being changed, transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, and all this is by the Spirit of the Lord. What he said was, he said, he said if you come into my presence covering your head with a cloth and have your face bowed down and saying, I'm unworthy, I'm unfit, he said, you're insulting what Jesus did for you at Calvary. And I saw that redeemed man is the only creature that, that can stand before God with unveiled face and look him in the face and worship him face to face and eye to eye and, and just glory in what God has made me. I hope you can see this. For me to, to crawl in like a worm is insulting the living God and insulting what he did for me at Calvary. And God says, I will not permit you to do that. Even if it's culturally a problem, you bear the reproach of that problem. Men, you have the guts to stand up for what you are in Christ and don't you... And don't you just submit to traditions so that you don't get a, so that you don't get unpopular with people? I tell you, I want you to be bold enough to declare who you are in Christ. Does that does that make sense to you? Now that's why we're going to do a whole school of the word on this sort of thing in in, in May because I want people to live in these things. No, I'm talking about. Saint, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is in. Where am I doing it? No, where, when am I doing it here? Oh, February. I'm sorry. In February. I guess I'm in February. I mean, a passion about this now. Not that we just know the hist really historic facts, but we come into the power that these things release. And, and, I, and I, I know this. I've come through this. And I can't bear to see people you know, going into these Jewish traditions. Now, don't misunderstand me. I love the Jewish people. God's going to do something very special and fantastic for them at the end of the age. And we are privileged to work closely with some wonderful Messianic Christians. But when they start putting on the head covering and all this kind of stuff and going back into this kind of unworthiness. It's, it's an insult, a horrible insult in the sight of God to the liberty which we've received in Christ. Does that, do you understand that? So, so he makes it very plain what the position is in man. Now let's just read what he says. So back to second, 1 Corinthians 11. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered or literally having his head down will be the correct translation of the Greek. Dishonors his head. Now who is his head? 
We're told it's Christ in verse 3. So, it's, so now, if you say you're dishonoring your head, you're saying that Jesus didn't do for you what he did for you, and you're still a sin-laden, unacceptable worm. Now, don't you dare do that because it insults your salvation. And I feel very strong. I hope you can feel it because I feel, I feel God so strong about this. I feel Paul is very strong as he writes this. And then come back down to verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. Okay, we got that part so far. That, so that's to me very clear. There's no, there's no discussion, there's no option here. Man must stand before God with unveiled face, beholding in his mirror the glory of the Lord, and, and even the angels are not able to have this kind of relationship with God. So, so God's lifted us above the angels in Christ. Isn't that fantastic? In intimacy and relationship we have with the Father, no angel has that relationship. They're there to minister to us, to obtain that relationship, but this is something unique and only for those that have been redeemed in Christ. What an incredible thing. So how can we lightly regard so great a salvation? Amen? Now let's come on. But then, then it comes to, uh, for the woman, for this reason. The woman ought to have, now you probably notice in your English translation, the word a symbol of authority upon her head because of the angels. Have you got that? Well, when you see the words in italics or a sign of authority, it says in some, in some translations, those words are not in the Greek text. So let's just read on. I think my notes are, are carefully written. So let's just read. In certain cultures, the sight of a redeemed woman enjoying her liberty in Christ, because she's the same redeemed being, and she has the same right, but her freedom might be misunderstood by society. It may not even be accepted by her husband. So she's got a head, a husband, and she's got a head who is Christ. Man has only one head, that's Christ. And he's made it very clear what he wants us to do. He wants us to stand in all the liberty that he's obtained for us at the cross. But for a woman who has the right to the same liberty, to step into that liberty could cause a backlash upon the honour of Jesus and upon the honour of her husband, if it's culturally unacceptable. And so a woman then is given the, the option. She has authority upon her head. Now that word, and, and it's nothing to do with the sign or similar authority, that's not in the Greek at all. It should never be in our English translation. Now as I went through the New Testament on this, I found 35 occasions where the identical Greek structure is there. And I'll give you one example. In John chapter 10 and verse 18, Jesus says, no man can take my life from me. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. It's exactly the same. In, other, and in every one of those 35 cases, the subject of the sentence always had authority over the predicate of the sentence. In other words, the, 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 you understand what I mean? In other words, Jesus has got the authority to lay down his life and take it up as he chooses. And no devil can take his life from him. He, he died at the precise moment that he chose to die. And nothing in hell could make it sooner or later. Hallelujah. I've got complete authority over my head, but I'm choosing to lay it down. Now, that's the way that it comes. And I can, I'm not going to take you through all 35 references, obviously. But you can search them out for yourself. But this is exactly the same construction. So what we're being told is this, that the woman has been given the authority to decide what's appropriate concerning her head. Where the cultural environment would not speak out the wrong message that she's a prostitute or that she's and therefore she ought to have a head shaved which was which is the harsh things that the jewish tradition and the talmud says it's not in it's not in the heart of paul and it's not in the heart of god a woman walks around with her head loose shave her head we'll make her we'll make sure she conforms in the future so she covers her head now that's the kind of vindictiveness of of the law it is not the heart of god it never was and it never will be it's in the talmud but it's not in the torah so she's got that option to say, well, if I were to walk down the street, enjoying my liberty in Christ with my head uncovered, I wouldn't have gone two blocks before they would be pointing their finger at me and say, there goes the prostitute. What kind, of, what kind of woman has he got? So it would dishonor her husband, it would dishonor the name of Christ. So where it's culturally going to be misunderstood, she has the, the, the freedom, the authority to decide it wouldn't be wise to do it, and therefore I'm going to cover my head. And you'll find that when Eileen goes to India and and when, when Basanti lives in India, in certain settings, she would not walk around with her head uncovered, although it's her liberty in Christ, because it would be totally misread by the society in which she's walking. And we don't want to make an issue of this and impede our ability to preach the gospel to them. So she'll just put a covering on her head. In her heart, she's still uncovered, but in society, she's covered in order not to cause unnecessary offence, which will stop people listening to the more important message of the gospel. Have you got that bit? I hope that's clear. But then it then says this. 
She has authority over it. I mean, she has the right to choose. And if she decides from God that it's better for her to walk around uncovered in spite of the reproach, then she has that choice also. And then he gets this phrase, because of the angels. And the word because is the little Greek word die, D-A-I, die, which comes again and again. And, and it has this idea of empowerment or enabling. And what God is saying is, look, if you, want to, if you want to take a stand against society which is crushing you and you believe it's God's will to do it, then, then an angel is going to come and stand with you and give you the power to do what you're not able to do yourself. In fact, just now, those of you who didn't get back quickly from lunch, an angel came right here and stood here in this meeting. I'm not telling you, because this was the subject that was just being taught, was the release of women from the wrong teaching to tell them in bondage. And angels, and I thought, angels are immediately here, say, look, if you have the courage to step out, I'll be there to strengthen you. Like, let me give you an example of this. I can do all things, because the word is often translated by the word because, it's often translated by the word through. I can do all things, what? Through Christ, it's the same word exactly there. Through Christ who strengthens me. Because of Christ, I can live a supernatural life. Because of the angel, a woman who wouldn't have the courage or ability to stand against the pressure of her society, she's given the enabling power of an angel to help her not to buckle into society, but to stand her ground in the name of Jesus. And God will send an angel to help you. Amen? Can you hear that? Just go to one more scripture, which I found very interesting as I was researching this. Come to, is this making sense to you? Have I got it right? Matthew 18, verse 10. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 18, and come to verse 10. Take heed that you not do... He's talking about little children that are... He lived in a society where children were despised. Amen? When the children rushed into the temple and began to worship and praise God, the Pharisees and the scribes were absolutely furious about it. Children were just like dirt despised, almost as bad as the way that women were treated. It was an anti-child society and it was anti-woman society. And they were the, the weakest, the most vulnerable. And, and in certain societies today, the way that children are abused, it just, it just breaks my heart. And it makes God angry. So here is Jesus. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I, I say to you that in heaven, their angel always sees the face. And, the, and, and actually the Greek word by is in, the die is in there, the same word, because their angel. It's not even in the translation in English, but it's there in the Greek. Be careful how you treat these kids because their angel always beholds the face of their father in heaven. If you start to mess these kids, you're messing with God and you're messing with the angels who are sent there to defend them. I thought, how interesting. It's such a parallelism here. As if God is so concerned for the weak and the underprivileged in society, he's going to send angels to defend them. Now, that, that, that's my God. That's the God I know. It makes absolute sense to me. So if a woman decides to step out culturally or even church-wise in a way that's going to cause trouble, but her husband says, you go for it, my dear, I'm right with you, then he'll send an angel to give her the strength to get through. And his angels are there to protect the children and protect the, the weakest parts of our society. They're ready to fight for them. I thought I felt tremendous when I saw it. Do you understand what I'm saying? That part I do understand. It made a lot of sense to me. So when I saw this, and I, I didn't see it as clearly then as I do now. So when I went to that Sunday night meeting and preached my heart out and much more besides, and the result was that everybody was, was convinced, apart from one or two people that were not, and, and the two that were not were my two very prominent head-covering women. They, they were sat there glowering at me for the way that I dared to speak. That tape, when it was finished, it went everywhere. And all over this network of churches to which I belonged, it went out like the hottest. Look what Alan said. And I was in terrific hot water with the leadership of that network. But I didn't care. I knew I'd spoken the truth. Come next Sunday morning, a week later, when the church came together, next Sunday morning, everybody was there now free from head covers, except the two women were sitting there with their heads covered. One of them was a wonderful, I mean, they were, one of them particularly was a wonderful, I mean, they were a Jewish couple, they were Cohen, they were Levites, that had been gloriously saved, were part of our church, wonderful couple. But because of these long-standing, strong Jewish tradition, she just could not, it wasn't that she was rebellious so much as she was, she couldn't break out of the tradition in which she lived all her life. She couldn't believe it was that easy or God was that good. So she came fearfully with her head covered and this other one who was the strong, more controlling type. And they sat there and during the morning worship, I suddenly noticed that at a certain point of tremendous worship, the two head coverings disappeared. And then this lady asked to come forward and gave testimony over the microphone. She said that while we were worshipping, this was in Garston Church, while we were worshipping, she said, I felt someone come and pull my covering off my head. And when I turned round, there was no one visible there, but I knew it was an angel. 
she testified to the church. She said, an angel tore my head covering off and I will never, ever, ever wear it again. <laughs> and the other one had a similar experience and from that day we were free. But mind you, we had a lot more trouble with our particular denomination, our particular network. We went, in fact, I was kicked out of the denomination over this issue primarily. But I don't regret it at all. So that just illustrates what we're talking about. God is concerned and God's involved and will even send angels in this wonderful way. I thought, how interesting that as we were meeting just before, after lunch, and we began to worship and praise, one of the people here in this, who's very sensitive about angels, said, there's an angel standing at the front here. I know why, because you want to deal with this thing. You want to deal with these deep fears and insecurities. Say, come on, I'm right with you to walk out of this thing into the glorious liberty in which Christ has set us free. Now I come to 1 Corinthians 14. Again, it's a long passage of scripture, and, and, and I, there are various opinions. It's difficult to understand, but in this, is, this is where it says, for example, this is, this is the, the, the punch part. It says, this is 34 if the, to 35 is, is the bit. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in the church. Well, that sounds pretty aggressive, doesn't it? And the first problem is that the law, the, the scriptures, the Torah, has no such statement in it. The law doesn't say, let a woman keep silent. There's nothing ever said that along those lines. It's in the Talmud, but it's not in the Torah. It's in the, the, the um, written oral law that the scribes and the Pharisees have interpreted out to make a rule book. Now, you may not be living under Jewish Talmud, but you could be living under Pentecostal Talmud, because the Baptists have written a pretty good Talmud of rules and regulations of what they think and feel the scriptures mean, and you better obey them or you'll be out of the church. The same with the Pentecostals, the same with many other denominations. Amen? It's no different to the conditions under which they were living in those days. And, and I believe that we've got to hear from God in a right sensitive way how we break out of the bondage of these things. I'm not talking about lawlessness, but if, if God says you do it and sends an angel to give you the strength to do it, then you better do it. So here are some suggestions. Some of, see, people are trying to understand this for almost 1,500 years, so it's a bit of an arrogant for me to think that I've got the answer. I haven't, but I think I've got some clarity. So here are some of the suggestions. Some have suggested, this is on page 11, that, that it was, there was a separate gallery of gossiping women whose loud talk was disturbing the men. Because the women were allowed to sit in and watch the men, but they were not allowed to participate in a, in a Jewish synagogue. And some suggest that that same tradition was carried into the church. In some parts of the world, you can see in the churches women and men separated because it's culturally the way that they do it. Like in India, for example. And I feel we've got to break that in Jesus' name because it's part of, the, of the, the ungodly traditions of the culture. It's not part of the kingdom. And it's not something that we accept. Well, that's our culture. Well, God says it's against his will. The second thing is some have suggested that Paul was answering a question that had been asked and not making a positive statement. Now, that's got a lot more weight. And I've, I'm, I'm, a, I'm competent in Greek, but I'm not what I'd call a Greek scholar. So I've been to some real Greek scholars and said, now, come on, is this a valid way of, of, of reading the Greek? which is to take it as a question, not a statement. Let me just let me give you an idea of how it sounds. Come to verse 34. Should not women keep silent in the churches? And are they not, are they not forbidden to speak? And should they not be submissive, as the law says? And if they want to learn anything at home, should they not ask their own husbands for, and is, is it not shameful for women to speak in the church? Now, that could be written that way. So it's speaking as a series of questions. And then Paul says, what? Did the word of God come originally from you, or was it, or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that these things which I write to you are the commandment of the Lord. In other words, I'm coming right against this in Jesus' name. That's a valid way to rewrite that text. But most Greek scholars wouldn't even accept it, but one or two would. Now, I've got to leave it with the experts. But I'm just saying it's a very possible and reasonable explanation of how this apparent strong commandment came. Now, let's start to deal with some of the words. First of all, the word to keep silent is not the correct translation of the Greek word. The Greek word has the idea of, of quietness. You know, like, for example, you, you, you're at home with, with some friends and they bring all their children. You've got six children upstairs playing, making a lot of noise. And you say, children, will you please be quiet? You're not saying, keep silent. You're saying, look, don't make a noise that disturbs us. Now, to give weight to that, come back to 1 Corinthians 14 and see what it has to say about uh, tongues and interpretation. If at verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let each one interpret. In other words, we've got such a, 
as such an abundance of gift, we've got to regulate who participates, because you can't have 2,000 people all, all wanting to participate at the same time. It's a totally new problem. The church in Corinth grew to 20,000 people. And you couldn't continue as if you were a group of 50 people. You've got to bring in some kind of regulation because you couldn't have these free falls where everybody's contributing, not in the setting when the whole church comes together. And this is the limitation. It only says when the whole church comes together, we're going to have to put in certain controlling regulations. Otherwise, we'll just be in chaos. The purpose is to have some godly order. It's not to put an absolute muzzle on, on the mouth of women here. All right? and, and so, but notice what it says about tongue speakers. It says... If there is no interpreter, verse 28, let him behave quietly, will be a better translation, and let him speak to himself and to God. That's pretty clear, isn't it? It's not saying silence. It's saying, don't let your tongue where to be disturbing the whole meeting when there's two or three other people trying to speak in tongues at the same time, and there's no possibility of getting the thing interpreted. The only point of public tongues is that one person speaks, someone else interprets, and then we can all be edified. And if we can't get that going, then it's better for you just to pray quietly to God in a way that doesn't disturb other people. And that's literally what it's saying in the Greek, and that makes a lot of sense to me. In the same context exactly, it says, let women behave quietly. And, 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 and it's also suggested that this could be confined to the particular issue of judging prophecy. Because Paul says, when someone prophesies, let the prophets judge. In other words, you don't accept everything, you judge it and say, that's from God and we need to take it seriously. Or, sister, would you please sit down while we sing another song? <laughs> and let's say a man, let's say, brother, would you mind doing that? Amen. And there's got to be some order, because the purpose of this is to edify the body of Christ, and that we're all built up. And there's got to be order, and he said, let everything done be decently in good order. We don't want a chaotic noise which has no meaning or sense to it. Now that's, that's the underlying principle. Here. As part of that, and as part of the old system was that if you, if you disagreed with what was being said in the oral educate, you could get up and say, excuse me, I don't, I don't agree with that, or, or could I ask a clarifying question? And that was perfectly okay. But when you're getting to thousands of people, you cannot behave as if you were still 20 people. I don't really think that prophecy was from God. Well, I've got a problem. It's not even scriptural. If, if she was to get up and speak it all out then and there, it would cause chaos. The second thing is that the word to speak isn't the normal Greek word for speaking, but it's a particular Greek word which has the, has the idea of having a long-term harangue about the whole thing. If you come to page 12, the word translated to speak in versions 34 and 35 is not the usual word for speaking, but it's a particular which means to hold a long haranguing discourse. In other words, you cannot get into a long-term argument with, with the, the teacher, not in this setting where we've got, we've got hundreds and hundreds of people all now disengaged while this thing goes on. He says, if you've got a problem, then you, you speak to your husband and let him decide whether this is the time to raise it, and maybe it's better to deal with it afterwards at home. So it's regulating the disorder which was otherwise there. It's not a mandatory, let the women keep silent. That's not really there at all. Does that make sense to you? Paul was probably saying if a wife has a doubt about something that was not taught or prophesied, she should hold back, leave it to her husband to speak on behalf of both of them if they really felt it necessary. If she still was unhappy, she should speak to him privately at home rather than have a long haranguing argument in the meeting which would not be edifying. That makes sense to me. Does it make sense to you? All right, come on to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 to 50. This is the toughest part of this, of this conference, all right? and, but I, I feel we've got to get these things in so we understand. 1 Timothy 2, coming in at verse 8. I desire, therefore, that men pray where lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting, in like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with proprietary and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearl or costly clothing, but what is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Now, every one of those words for women and all those words for men can equally be translated husband and wife. Verse 11, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to usurp authority is a better translation over a man but to be in silence. Now, this is a, this is a tricky one. And um, that book that we mentioned earlier, by Charles Trombe. He spent several pages of very careful analysis of this, and I found that tremendously valuable when I read it some years ago. But, but what, what is strange is that there's a particular word here, the word which is translated usurp, which is a better translation than have authority. It's not, it's not exousia, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, the word is authentis, which is to 
forcefully take what you have really no right to take. It's also used in the sense of violently murdering. I don't allow, and, and if you think of the husband-wife context rather than the man-woman context, a woman could get up and she could violently murder her husband's reputation by the way that she speaks out in an improper way. And, and this particular word that's used is the bottom of page 12 now, authentes or usurp. It is, was only used in this one place in scripture. We have no other scriptural reference for it. The word was hardly used even in decent secular writing. Greek, light, Greek literature at the time the scriptures were being written because it had such a coarse and crude connotation. The word authentic is gradually changing its meaning to mean something much more respectable, but not until the fourth century. So at the time the Bible was written, it, it meant to usurp or replace or to steal a position of authority. But before that, that is going back to the time Paul wrote this, it didn't mean that. It meant to physically and violently murder or to sexually lounge at or entice. And it was used quite often of the women Gnostic teachers, that they would, they would um, uh, assault people. Um, they would violently stir them by a mixture of, of acts, of, 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 of work, music and of physical acts, like some of our pop singers do. They, they stir something up. I won't give you a demonstration, but you know what I'm talking about. By, by physical gestures and by, by tones of voice and by the words they were using, they, they, would, they, would, they would assault people. And, 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 and capture them by, by the, the soul power, or even worse, by the demonic power of the way in which they were speaking. It wasn't spirit at all. And there were some people you can hear, and, and it's soul power, it's not, it's not spirit at all. I mean, you think of someone like Farrakhan. Ever watch a speech by Adolf Hitler, and that's a demon. I mean, the way they could sway people, you know, it, it, it's so demonic. Now, this was the sort of thing that's been talked about. And, and the problem, it would seem, was that Gnostic teachers were coming into the church and using Gnostic methodology to, to get people to, to listen to them in the, the free-for-all, which was the average church meeting. And Paul says, I'm not permitting that. I'm not allowing them to use their teaching gift to dishonor their husband and to almost rape the church with the violence and strength of the words and by the, 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 the way that they're behaving. He said, we're going to have to stop this right away because this was right in the middle of a time when Gnosticism was, was violently attacking the church. If you go into the, the book of Revelation, you will find particularly in Ephesus this sort of thing was. And Paul wrote this to Timothy while he was apostolic overseeing the church in Ephesus and seeing the church in Asia. So this was a, this was a current battle. Now we've got these things today. And we've got people that are, you know, I mean, going much too far in what's called seeker-friendly stuff just to get people to come and to entice them. And we've got multimedia presentation. And it's all, it all feeds the soul, but it doesn't touch the spirit. So I believe it's limited to that. And it's not a, an injunction for women to keep silent in the church or to learn in silence. Now, because we find in other places, this is obviously contradicted. So if you go to this book, if you want to, by Charles Tromley, who says a woman can't teach. He, he does a great job of particularly explaining this thing. So the question is, why did Paul use this very offensive word in AD 69 when it meant sexually to lunge at, to sexually entice, to violently assault? This is the idea. We can't be absolutely sure. Maybe some of the converted temple prostitutes brought some of these practices in with them after professing conversion and were trying to continue to use these same methods to teach in the meetings within the church. And I said for several years uh, uh, now, and it seems like I was prophetic, prophesying without reading I said, supposing Madonna suddenly starts to get a bit religious and decides she wants to preach Christ and the cross and she starts using her methodology. To, and here we are right now, that's exactly what she's seeking. She's got some weird kind of religiousness has come over her and she's, and, and she's trying to put on some concerts where she is hanging on the cross in some sort of way and, and somehow she's hoping this will bring people, supposedly to bring people to a knowledge of Jesus. Now, so, so it's almost like, and everybody's rightly saying, not on your life, I don't want, well that's possibly what was happening then. It's happening, it seems, right now today. And obviously there's no place for that. All right, let me just continue on for a few more things and then we're gonna have come to the break. As we started a bit late, I'm gonna finish a bit late. Is that okay with you? So. In the local church, it's not a matter of order. It's a matter of order, not a matter of gender. No one, male or female, should teach in a way that undermines the apostolic doctrine or undermines the authority of the head of the church. It's not to do with women. It's to do with men or women. They have no right to, to, to undermine the apostolic doctrine or to undermine the authority of the head of the church. 
And if a woman does that through her sexual enticements, then it's got to be absolutely stopped because it's, it's violating the authority of the church. It's not so much because she's a woman, but she's just using certain techniques here which are offensive. Is that okay? Let's move on now. At the bottom of page 13, we, I start the, the function, okay, what about women in ministry? And I point out to you, as you've already seen, that women are to, free to function fully with the men. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 is not limited to, to men. The word is anthropos, and it includes both genders. If every, everyone has a tongue, a prophesy, or a teaching, and it's nothing to do with gender, it's whether it comes from God. Okay? Come to page 14. Women in leadership. It is in order for women to be leaders, but they, like the men, must function submissively under the final head. And in other words, today, if I was planting church, I would have, I would have the mothers who are elders in the church along with the, along with the fathers who are elders in the church. I'd have them both. I, I would have a mixed eldership because the contribution of these godly women is, I found, to be so valuable that, it, that, that when you put them together, you've got the best of what you have in a home. After all, a home without a father is a miserable place. And a home without a mother is a miserable place. Together, they make up what God wants the family to be. And the father has a part to play, the mother has a part to play, but each of them have government. They're governmental, but there is a headship order to that government. Now, the same is true in the church. There's a final head, which God appoints. As we pointed out uh, uh, earlier today, that in the case of Jerusalem, the first church which came into existence, there was one head, James, who was a consultative servant head, wasn't Peter, surprisingly, but all those apostles were there. We had elders there. We had all kinds of great prophets, everybody, but they, and they contributed significantly to discerning God's direction and God's will, but it finally passed through the filter of what is the judgment of the head, and that's the way it has to be. But I would, I would certainly no longer consider, I wouldn't want a eldership where it was all fathers and no mothers. Because motherhood is such a powerful part of government and it's such a powerful contribution to the way God want, wants things. It's, okay, next statement, women in government. Once the fatherhead has been set, the rest is a matter of order, not gender. And the church is much richer if it has mothers as well as fathers in government and has an active part of the decision-making process. A church just like home suffers a great loss without mothers as well as fathers. Amen? Right, now let's move on to Phoebe now. Come to Romans chapter 16. Phoebe is a good example of what we're talking about. Come to Romans chapter 16. I want you to see how the, the Greek is mistranslated to maintain error of male domination. Verse 1 of chapter 16. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant, a diakonos. She's a deacon, if you like. She's a servant. But Jesus used that word about himself. He said, I've come among you one who serves. And he calls everyone in the church with whatever authority they may have, including all apostles, Paul uses the word, it's still you come as a servant. You're here to serve the church, but you serve the church with an authority which God gives you. But that doesn't mean you chuck your weight about it. It doesn't mean that you are uh, controlling or bombastic. You are, you are a consultative servant head. Verse 2, uh, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and a sister in whatever business she has need of, of you, for indeed she has been, and here is it translated by the word helper, and that's an unfortunate, horrible mistranslation. The word is prostatis, and this is the uh, from the, the word proistemi. It's, I won't go into all the technicalities of the Greek, but it basically is the same word that's used in 1 Timothy 5:17, where we're told there that he that labours in the word and in teaching is worthy of double honour. Now, here, for some reason, she's called helper which is a total mistranslation, is there's no right for that word to be there. But, but what, what it should say is, is, is that, and it, it, it's talking about elders who rule well, and, and they're to be afforded double honour because they, they labour in the word and teaching, and the word is, is proistemi, they rule well. So this is a word of rule, and the word proistemi, it means to, to stand before, and, and, and to stand before having rule, to be prominent, to have rule and to have authority. So Phoebe was obviously a strong, powerful leader and ministry in the church in Centria, and Paul instructed the church in Rome that she was to be afforded every assistance when she came from Centria. She had also been entrusted with carrying the precious original manuscript of the Roman letter. She was the carrier of that letter. She brought it from Centria to Rome, quite a journey in those days. And they were to treat her with all the honour and, 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 and which her office required. That all disappears in the English, but it's there in the Greek. 
I want you to treat her as a, as a, as a woman with, with, with rule, with prominence and with authority in her home church. Now you treat her in, with appropriate honour when she comes to the church in Rome. Now we come down to ministering couples. Bottom of page 14. The greatest example in scripture are Priscilla and Aquila, and they are a powerful joint ministry together. It's interesting, if you go through these references I've given you, that Priscilla is mentioned first several times, particularly when they are in joint ministry. It was Priscilla and Aquila who took Apollos after he had come to uh, Corinth. And, 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 and let's just perhaps read that for a moment. Come to Acts chapter 18. Have you got time for this? To Acts chapter 18. Let's just look at this. He says in verse 24, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. I'm sorry, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, although he only knew the baptism of John. So he was defective in his understanding of baptism, of living in the power of the resurrection, and the spirit had not yet come upon him. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And so they brought him into a revelation, and he then became a, a, a mighty uh, teacher that greatly helped Paul in the breakthrough in Ephesus. If you look at these different references, which we won't do, you'll find that Priscilla is often named first, Priscilla and Aquila. But we also learn from all these scriptures that Priscilla and Aquila had a church in their house. It's mentioned twice in scripture. And when it refers to the church in their house, it's Aquila and Priscilla. I wouldn't make too much of this, but it's interesting that the, the names should be reversed. So when it comes to the church where he has headship, his name comes first. When it comes to the teaching gift, Priscilla name comfort as if she's got the better teaching now that's a pure surmise of mine but i sniff and suspect that that's true certainly i know i can think of a number of couples and probably you could think of some people where the woman is a much more powerful teacher has a much much more powerful public ministry and, and anyway i won't mention any names but you know what i'm talking about but they've got a husband that stands with them is right with them in the ministry and she submits to him as the head of their marriage and he's there strengthening and encouraging her in the far greater public ministry gift that she carries now, there were such things in the early church, and there are such things today. And those, those people are not out of order. One good example would be Cindy Jacob. You know that couple? She's got a wonderful man right beside her, and <laughs> totally supporting her. But, but she's, she's, got, she's the powerful one, and he, and, and he, he administrates, and he, he enables her to f fulfill the ministry she's got. But, but I tell you, when it comes to the headship in the home, there's a, a question about who's got the headship. So it, the marriage is in right order, but it's a woman with a stronger gift. Now, that's got its problems, but uh, and it takes grace to solve those problems, but it's a real thing that we have today. And we're also told in Romans chapter 16, verse 7, it tells us there, in the original Greek manuscript, the female form junior is used, not the male form junius, as some English translations have wrongly translated it. Maybe, maybe we have another apostolic couple here, although there's nothing to indicate that these two were married. It just says Adronicus and Junior. But what it says is that they are, of, they, are of, they are outstanding, they are of note among the apostles. So it could be, and I think this is almost certainly true, that we have a lady apostle who wasn't, she was outstanding among the apostles. And she's noted with another man called Adronicus. And, and she's outstanding apostle. That's what it says. So things are beginning to break open in the church as you can see. Next statement I want to make, non-ministering wives are prominent leaders. Now, you can get a prominent male leader like a pastor of the church, and, or he may be his wife, often is his wife. He cannot make her the associate pastor and give her stage if she's not carrying that kind of gift or anointing or ministry. Now, she's his wife, and she's always to be shown as his wife, but she cannot be assumed to have a, a public ministry or a public governmental authority oh, just because she's married to her husband she's got to be who she is and he's got to be who he is and she needs to step back and be allowed to be she shouldn't have to run the women's work she shouldn't have to be doing this and that just because she's his she's got to be allowed to be herself now a great example of this that i know of course is is um, reinhold bonke's wife annie i mean sorry anna i thought she was annie. anna her name now she hates the limelight she hates being asked to stand up in fact she but i tell you that woman she intercedes she's 10 hundred percent behind her man in every way i mean she just lays her life down for the ministry he's away a lot but when when he comes home she just lavishes upon him the, the help that he needs but there's nothing about her that's public she hates being in a big conference and being asked to stand up and she just she doesn't want to have attention drawn to her and there's nothing public about her at all but she's she's a mighty mighty prayer warrior alongside her husband 
and he's got the public ministry and she's got the private intercessory ministry which in the sight of God is just as important and just as powerful but it's just got a different function in the church. So the bottom line is that everybody must be allowed to be who they really are. Whom God has, and you can't put any of your family members into positions of ministry just because you, they're your family members. You've got, it's got to be truly and genuinely of God. That's wives or children. You can't make it a family business. The church doesn't work that way. What's on their life, what God's calling them to be, is what they legitimately must become. On the other hand, you, couldn't, you don't resist them because they are your family either. I mean, you can fall off this log either way. But it's what they really are in God that they've got to be released to do. When it's a, a married couple, then the man and the woman have to find their place in God and their partner works with them in what that calling is. Now, the next final, I always said, non-ministering wives with powerful gifted, non-ministering men with powerful gifted wives. I've already covered that and they've got particularly difficult things to work out together. But, but they'll hear from God and learn how to do it. Single women, page 14. What, I'm sorry, page 15, the bottom of the page. Many single and some married women follow Jesus. You look at Luke 8, verses 1 to 3. And there were many single and some married women in Paul's apostolic team. In Romans chapter 16, verses 3 to 16, there are 36 people who are named as being in Paul's team. 11 of them are women. I've counted them. That's a third of his team were women in his apostolic team. And, and Paul calls these women by various names. He calls them fellow soldiers. He calls them fellow workers. He calls them fellow prisoners. Some even went to jail with him. And they were part of his team. Amen? Powerful ministers. And uh, they had that privilege and that role. 1 Corinthians 7, 34, 35, advocates celibacy as a gift for certain people so as to serve the Lord without distraction. This is advocated for women as well as for men. If so, there must be full-time ministry and leadership roles for these women to fulfill. Would you agree with that? In the history of the church, the majority of pioneer missionaries have been women. That's the history of the church. If we would have a hall of fame for the missionary activity the last 200 years, I think you'd probably find 75% of them will be women. And the same is true in many social issues and political issues. Women have been absolutely outstanding, in spite of the culture, in spite of many obstacles. I mean, you, you read some of the stories of you know, some great missionary ladies, Jackie Pullinger, what's the lady in India? Amy Carmichael? Oh, there's so many. We, we, there's, there's dozens of them, dozens of them, dozens of them. So if we were to make a list of right, who were the most notable the powerful you know, advances of the kingdom, the most powerful evangelists, the most powerful warriors in the spirit that pulled down principalities and powers and destroyed demonic strongholds. If we were, if we were to list them, we were, I would, I'm only guessing, I've never actually done it, but I'm tempted to do it. I was, we have a book in at home which is, which is, which is got on the front cover, it's got 50, I think about 50 faces, and it says, heroes of faith, you know, and every one of them is a white man. And that really offends me. I thought, well, this guy's got a rather jaunted perspective, amen? It ought to be more than 50% women and probably more than 50% African-American black faces, if, if the truth were told, amen? Well, not African-American, just black faces. All over Africa, you meet these incredible giants. If you go to China, you meet these incredible giants, men and women that have done absolutely amazing things. And so, but it just shows you how deeply entrenched these things are and how it's, they've got to be removed in Jesus' mighty name, amen? And then we're going to see something let loose in the church that's going to bring it to the full fullness. We've got to have this restored so that the church can be what it's supposed to be in these days. Amen? Amen?